Hey, how you doing? My name is Patrick Long. I'm a ex-Porsche factory driver, two-time winner in the GT class at the 24 Hour of Le Mans. I'm here to walk you through a little bit of simulator trading in the 992 GT3 Cup car from Porsche. Most of today will apply to any type of simulator, something state-of-the-art like this CXC rig here, which is full motion, completely cockpit adjustable, or a basic off-the-shelf simulator. The most important thing is, is that you have a high-quality set of hardware, your steering wheel, your pedals, and your chassis that are all synced up. They're rigid. They allow you to completely immerse yourself in the hardware so that then you can focus on your job on screen. Just like a race car, it is so important where your body starts. When you get into your sim, first thing you wanna think about is that distance. How close is the steering wheel? How close is the pedals? You'll see with the CXC Motion 2 that everything uh, pedal and steering related moves in one. Today we're running the Formula steering wheel from CXC. Uh, great quick release hub, again, all authentic racing hardware. I like to have about a wristwatch length between the top spoke of the steering wheel and your wrist. You have a slight bend in your knee, even when you're at full throttle. No straight legs, but also not crouched up where you're gonna have your knee getting in between your steering. As you can see, the CXC Sim has a nice rock back, which is very realistic for the GT3 Cup car and a lot of different race cars that I've driven. This rig has a tensioner setup on the seatbelt. So the way I'm gonna set up today is just like in a real race car. I'm first gonna get my lap belt set tight. You wanna be really rigid, pulled right back against the back of the seat, get your hips tight, keep that center lap belt low, and then plug in your shoulder belts, sort of setting them up to come vertically straight down your body. Um, in this rig, I'm probably 75% of what I would have in a race car just enough that there's not really any excess slack. Everything is very much set up for a driver by drivers. That authenticity not only gives you uh, a full immersion, but it's also just a really nice piece of hardware. The great thing about the Motion 2 is they give you these auxiliary buttons and you can customize them yourself. With the CXC rig, they already have a lot of these knobs and steering wheel buttons pre-programmed in. Steering, resistance, Amount of lock is super important. Braking force adjustment. The great thing here is we're running a full hydraulic, real bottom feed pedal setup. I'm gonna run a decently hard brake pressure setting in this design with the 992 GT3 Cup. It's a non ABS setting in the game. And with that, you wanna have a lot of feel and a modulation ability, because of course, if the front wheel is locked, you wanna be able to trail out of that brake. But of course, if you're in a big aero section and you wanna add a lot of braking force, you'll be able to do that. Another in cockpit adjustability is vibration. Basically curbs, dropping wheels, making contact with another car. You want a little bit of force. There's a kicker in the back of the seat and I can adjust that here in cockpit. Race cars have stiff springs, stiff dampers. Uh, there's not a lot of travel. Personally, I like to run less travel with a little bit faster, higher frequency setting. And the great thing is, depending on the track, depending on the driver, that is all available to you uh, right here in cockpit. A great advancement in sim racing is a second tier V-Box, where you can actually record your sim racing and then send it out to a coach, compare notes with another driver, recording your in-driving video as well as telemetry. A really key setting in game for iRacing are track conditions and weather. Once you go into the menu, there's a lot of different variables here and it makes a huge difference, not only in how the car reacts to tire wear, how it handles, but also the lap time that you're going to produce. First of all, in setting weather, you've got three different options of your overall uh, condition. Then you move down through temperature, humidity, wind speed, initial weather variation, ongoing weather variation. So it gets very specific looking at the different setups in game. First thing we'll talk about is force feedback. Uh, we have two key settings that I like to focus on. First of all, the strength, the amount of force feedback that's actually being produced and given to the driver. And then the second setting being wheel force. We have 16 newton meters of max wheel force. So we set those two parameters, bookending what you wanna use and how much your hardware can give you.
So as I mentioned, 2023, the 992 version, the latest iteration of the GT3 Cup car from Porsche. If you go into your chassis setup and really how you can engineer the car, starting at tires and aero, each of your individual contact patches or tires, you have a starting pressure, your last hot pressure from the previous session, your temperatures across the spread of inner shoulder, middle of the tire and outer, and then how much tread was remaining in that session based on how long you ran and how much wear you were producing with your tire. This is a great place to really look at how the tires are reacting and behaving from the previous session. And then of course, the one thing that you can adjust is your starting pressures based on the feedback and the learnings and understandings that you had from your previous session. On the chassis page, quite a few different settings here. Some are limited based on the car that you have in iRacing. Some things are locked by spec because that's actually how it is in real life. For instance, in the cup cars, you can't change the spring. Here we start in the front uh, with your anti-roll bar settings, how stiff you want your anti-roll bar, really that relationship of lateral uh, anti-roll and how the relationship of one tire to the other behaves. If you think about anti-roll, traction, turn-in, mechanical grip at a kind of fine-tuning aspect versus bigger wholesale changes such as spring rates, ride heights, aero, etc. Your toe, fuel level, how much fuel you're running in the car, that might be a strategy thing based on how long the race is or if you're taking fuel out of the car to run lighter for qualifying. Cross weight is really just a reading based on some of the other calibrations or settings that you're running with your suspension. Corner weights, ride heights, spring perch offset, camber. These are all things that I've set up and fine tuned, not so much for a track specific or optimum lap time, but something that you can use for training from track to track to track. One thing I find in iRacing is there's so much time investment in really tuning a car for ultimate pace or race pace and making your tires last. Find something that works for you. This setup will be in the comments below and you can utilize that and maybe you'll love it, maybe you won't. But basically what I've done is set up a car that's reactive enough to braking and trail braking. There's still a little more understeer from mid quarter to exit, especially on throttle than I would prefer or would say is ultimately how one of these cars handles, but it does the trick for training. So now sitting in pit lane in the car, one thing that I like to fine tune to different cars with inside of iRacing or other softwares is the view, the depth, how far back you're sitting from the steering wheel, how high the driver is in relationship to steering and dash and how zoomed in or out you are. Um, on this sim, again, it's great to have cockpit adjustability because I can make these on the fly or quickly without leaving uh, the game and going back into the garage. So pushing the view button, and then first thing I'm gonna look at is field of view, both backing up, which is the plus button of the FOV button, and then the actual tilt of the driver. And then the last one is the height of the driver in relationship head to dash. So today we're gonna run Watkins Glen, one of the most traditional old school, high risk tracks in the world. So one of the things I like to do on a new racetrack or with a new car inside of a simulator is to do kind of a virtual track walk. So I'm gonna roll out on track, give you guys a little bit of play by play of what my experience for 20 years racing at this racetrack, what I like to note in game. Uh, pit lane is pretty quick and pretty short here and it spits you right out onto the exit of turn one. Basically there's a blend line, hold drivers right along the, the white line and get up into the elevated S's already. Um, in a racing session, I like to stay driver's right, checking my mirror as I poke down into uh, the S's and up over the top of the hill. This is a two, three, four section. As you see, the walls are super tight on both sides. There's very little for margin for air. And when there is an incident on track here, there's really not a lot of places for cars to go. So again, part of the old school flavor of Watkins Glen, uh, it should be mostly flat in game. Uh, it's a lot of aero, a lot of speed, but placement on track is super, super important. Um, I'm gonna stop for a minute and just look at this inner loop. Some people call it the bus stop. The old Watkins Glen actually went straight on through the cones. The idea here is how your car handles, how much of this flat curb you can take, it will upset the car a little bit. So this corner, uh, both in game and in reality is faster than you think, but it's one that you wanna definitely work up to. 
Uh, I would say about half of car width that you can kind of maintain safely, but get used to that, especially in game when your tires are cold, uh, it will kick the rear up and send you for a bit of a ride. Luckily, in this day and age at Watkins Glen, there's a bit of runoff if you do get it wrong. So sort of staying right in a spin helps you for a, a bit, but you can get into trouble quickly. Um, when we get to speed, you will see just how fast the exit of this corner is, and that splits you down into the outer loop, or some people call it the carousel. Uh, it's about a three quarters track entry, depending on how much downforce you have. A GT3 Cup car in this generation is making quite a lot of downforce, but driver line is probably half track down to 25% off of the curb, and about three quarters of the way through is your clipping point, allowing the car to track all the way out realizing that here there's maybe four feet of grass and then a barrier so it's essentially a wall and you really want to get your visual references you want to get your eyes up before you feed into the throttle uh, fourth gear corner it's pretty fast pretty treacherous now we're dropping into the traditional part of Watkins Glen which is the boot uh, we're sort of at the top of the boot turn six it's a decreasing radius uh, some of it's off camber there's a little bit of camber on the way in but as you can see here my field of view is very limited and you can't see much of the corner. You're actually committed to throttle before you can see the exit of the quarter, which takes some time. It takes some confidence. This is the type of track that I would want to spend a lot of time in sim before I go to in reality because circuit knowledge is free on the sim. Uh, you don't have to go there and pound around for half a day learning the track. And I love utilizing uh, sim for new tracks or just refining uh, my mental and visual um, ability to stay super focused. Turn seven, if you stop here at about the 300 board and look into it, it's obvious that it's a lot of ascend. It's climbing while you're trail breaking. The real understanding here is that the hill will catch you as you get into the corner. Important thing is to, again, turn your head look up the racetrack and feed the throttle in because you've got a long climb from seven all the way down to eight. I would say we're gonna be inside the 200 board here in a real race car. And if the game will let me, uh, I'll be sending it in here as deep as I can with the idea that I can trail brake. It's digressive braking, but I want a little bit of trail brake to keep the nose pinned. Right about here, I'm already striving to look up the hill look for where that exit curb might be and feed the throttle in as soon as possible. There's a little bit of runoff on the exit, a little bit of extra tarmac. If you're really on a good one, it's there to use, but on cold tires or relying on it is not always the best thing because as you see, it tapers into grass. So you kind of want to get back on inside the white line uh, before you're really, really opening your hands. The approach to turn eight, a great passing zone. It's a late, hard break. It's as hard as you're gonna break anywhere on the racetrack, so you can really get after that threshold break. And because it's a longer radius corner, even though it's the slowest corner on the track, it's key that you do release the break and keep some rolling speed. You wanna maintain minimum speed all the way through in the rhythm of Watkins Glen. The full track and the short track require that same amount of discipline, which is trusting the front tire believing that you can come off the brake and that you have product of proper track placement, which will get you the ability to keep your minimum speed up and feed in the throttle as soon as possible. So here in eight, uh, you wanna get down to the apex, see that apex curb. Everything is an advantage if you can take just enough apex curb, not crushing it or running into the grass. But if you can get down to your apexes in the game, it is a little bit more of an advantage. Uh, it seems to hook the car in exiting the boot turn nine this is a another slow corner very late apex there's two ways to do this there's either an, an early entry and sort of a double apex but in my driving style both in game and in reality it's always one late apex and it's earlier throttle than you think again probably equal in discipline of hard braking and rolling speed to the previous corner turn eight. A Little bit of a short shoot, building speed, getting up to fourth gear. Turn 10 is very quick, again, blind on the approach. So you're already feeding in maintenance throttle before you see the exit. 
takes discipline, takes track knowledge, takes bravery. Final corner being turn 11, another corner that's just really about commitment of releasing the brake early, feeding in progressive throttle, which is sort of pausing that deceleration curve, and then getting your eyes up, feeding the throttle in. I get after the throttle pretty aggressively here because we're in third, fourth gear. You're already going pretty quick. You've got a lot of arrow working for you. And with that, you want to keep your momentum up. So not a lot of uh, hairpin corners here at Watkins Glen. It's really keeping that discipline, having a good arrow balance, having a stiff race car and liking fast racetracks. Now let's go into a little bit more speed so that you can see the flow of this lap. Up the front straightaway at Watkins Glen, you understand that you're not gonna see the full extent of turn one by the time you're already into braking. As you poke over into the apex, there it is, right front tire down on the curb, just over the exit curb, not too far as iRacing and BMC officials will call you for four wheels over the yellow line. Building up into the two, three, and corner four section, it's flat out all the way in sixth gear at the top of the hill. Building speed, opening your hands onto the straightaway. Back straightaway is a fast section. A lot of overtaking possibilities here. As we go into the inner loop, I'm taking about half the car over the first apex curb and then really trying to stay in contact with each of the four curbs as I get into the outer loop. In the outer loop, I'm clipping down at about three quarters here. Maybe not all the way to the curb, but with the intent of that being the tightest part of my radius. Turn six, be disciplined on the way in, get down to your apex curb, get to throttle before you can even see the exit curb, but get right to it if you're gonna carry the max momentum as you head down into the heel of the boot. Now we're into the toe, turn seven, it's uphill. We're building speed using all the racetrack on the exit, grabbing fourth gear, another overtaking possibility as you come down into eight, it's really about an early downshift. Get down into that apex curb, pick your eyes up, and use all of the racetrack on the exit. Swing the car back over driver's right, down into turn nine. Again, late apex, early throttle. Don't get wheel spin like me. Up to fourth gear, turn 10. Brush of the brake, maybe just maintenance throttle. Be careful on the exit, all the way to the exit curb, and then swing it back left. Get straight hands before you turn into 11. Feed the throttle on early, run all the way up to the blue wall over the exit curb, but it takes a few laps to get used to that. A little bit of takeaway from Watkins Glen. In summary, these are faster corners than you think. That discipline is a good initial hit of the brake, digressive brake release. As soon as you know you're gonna get to your apex, cover that throttle pedal and get ready to induce linear progressive throttle, opening your hands, picking your eyes up, spotting that exit curb. Watkins Glen is one of the toughest tracks in the world. The stakes are high, but it's so rewarding. When you put the time in, you get your consistency up before you put the aggression into it. A lot of young drivers that I work with in the Porsche development ladder, it's all about that rhythm. It's all about the confidence. It's about visualization and it's about logging laps. Thanks for coming along for the ride. We'll see you on the next one.